aperture. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. My name is Denise Wolf, and I am a senior editor here at Aperture. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, it was founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for photography. Aperture Today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Um, we're thrilled to be joined tonight by Liz Akiriko, June Clark, Dr. Kenneth Montague, and Bedemi Oloyede the, to celebrate the newly published book, As We Rise, Photography from the Black Atlantic. This event is the final, um, is the final one in our series of online, um, online talks where we discuss the various themes and chapters in As We Rise. You can watch recordings of the other two events on Aperture's YouTube channel and by following the links in the chat. Just a little bit about the book. Um, I think it's really best summed up. I'm gonna quote from Liz's chapter text. Um, she's, she writes, presented against a profound um, deficiency in positive representations of the community depicted in popular culture and the contemporary art world, the pictures in this book and in the Wedge collection forefront the experience of Black life in all its myriad of forms, a marker of the histories and spaces, real and ephemeral, that transcend geographic boundaries, from photo studios in Mali to the nightclubs in southeastern Brazil to the streets of Manhattan or Toronto. Um, this collection extends out to the global diaspora and proclaims we are home. I really think this gets at the heart of the book and I hope tonight's discussion, um, you feel that vibe as well. Um, it's tonight's discussion will be moderated by Liz Akiriko, a Toronto based Nigerian Canadian artist and curator. She is um, curator of collections and contemporary engagement at the Art Gallery of York University, Toronto, and co curator of the 13th Rencontre de Bamako, African Biennale um, of Photography in Mali 2022. Her most um, recent curatorial projects include Is Love a Synonym for Abolition at Gallery 44 in Toronto, A Lineage of Transgression at Art Space um, Peterborough, and The Break, the Wake, the Hold, the Breath at Circuit Gallery Prefects ICA in Toronto. Um, her writing appears in As We Rise, uh, along with features in the British Journal of Photography, Public Journal, Mice Magazine, C Magazine, Black Flash, and Akimbo. Akiriko holds an MFA in Criticism and Curatorial Practice from Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto. Um, I'm also really pleased to introduce tonight's panelists for the evening, uh, Dr. Kenneth Montague. He started the Wedge Collection in 1997 to acquire and exhibit art that explores Black identity. In addition to the Wedge Collection, Montague founded Wedge Curatorial Projects, a nonprofit arts organization that helps to support emerging Black artists. Um, a Toronto-based art collector, Montague has been a member of, art, of the Art Gallery of Ontario's Board of Trustees since 2015. He served on the African Acquisitions Committee at Tate Modern London and is an advisor to the Department of Arts of Global Africa and the Diaspora at the Art, Gall art Gallery of Ontario. Also joining us is June Clark. Uh, June has earned international recognition for her photo-based image works, installations, and interventions. She has had solo exhibitions at Daniel Faria Gallery, um, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Power Plant, and Mercer Union. Her work has been included in survey exhibitions at the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Textile Museum, the National Gallery of Canada, and Gallery du Jour Agnes B. Agnes B. She has completed residencies at the Studio Museum in Harlem and the Ontario College of Art and Design, among others. Also joining us is Bedemi Oloyedi. He, he's an emerging artist. Uh, he's an emerging street and photographer, and portrait photographer, I'm sorry, capturing the energy and emotion of social landscapes using predominantly black and white film. Uh, his impulsive documentary style is a reflection of the interaction and dialogue between the photographer and subject. He's invested in the physicality of film, the historical legacy of image making and its chemical context, uh, and the laborious process of traditional darkroom techniques to expose the realities of every day. 
Oloyedi is originally from Port Harcourt, Nigeria, and is now based in Toronto. He holds a BFA in photography from the Ontario College of Art and Design. Tonight's program is supported in part by generous donations from um, Aperture's Board of Trustees, our members, and other individuals. Aperture's programs are made possible in part by the New York State Council on the Arts and with support of the New York State Legislature. Legislator. Additional support for As We Rise was provided by Drs. Frederick and Liza Morrell, Dawood Bay, and John Ellis. Please be sure to put any questions you may have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll, we're going to get to those toward the end of the evening. Now, I'd like to hand it over to Liz. Thank you so much. Thank you, Denise. Um, uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone and also to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Takaranto, Toronto, which is the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And as a Nigerian first-generation Canadian woman, I am an unsettled, uninvited, and very grateful guest on this land. Um, I have had um, the, the sincere, true joy um, and honor of working on As We Rise um, as a consultant and writer. And um, I really just need to acknowledge that that was such an incredible um, experience. It was so collaborative and I'm so grateful to the Aperture team, to Denise um, and Lana Swindle um, and the Wedge team, uh, Maria Kanalopoulos, Emily Croning, and of course, Kenneth. Um, it's really genuinely, it's so energizing um, uh, to know that there are ways of doing powerful, really important and timely uh, work in a caring and considerate um, way. It's, it's, it was really a wonderful experience. Um, so yeah, before I hand over the mic, I just wanted to um, make note of the fact that Kenneth, um, for anybody that doesn't know, is the ultimate connector supporter, interlocutor of community. Um, he is he's a bastion of, um, of Black photography and art, but also, you know, I, my relationship with him um, goes way back to, I think, 2004, <laughs> almost 20 years ago now. Um, and um, when I was a server um, at a restaurant and we we're that was near his dental practice. So um, it was just really amazing to have these, these beginnings where, you know, Ken would come in and talk about um, going to, like going to an art fair in New York and spending time with his friend Thelma Golden. And I was hoping my eyes weren't bugging out of my head because I was so excited. I'd done my undergrad in photography. I'd written about Thelma and um, her influence on me was great. So, and still is. So this was really, and, and at that point, um, can all, right away was able to kind of make these connections and support my um, my my direction into photography in Toronto and um, so I am ever grateful um, and this isn't this isn't just a personal story this is something that you will see time and time again um, the connection between Kenneth and and a number of artists and curators and writers is really profound and I think that. Um, the Wedge Collection has always been a guide on how to draw attention to Black agency and presence, beauty, style, strength, um, creativity, joy and tenacity, and, um, and really also it's a way to not get caught up in reactivity or reactionary motivations. I think that's one of the things that really is, is um, profound through As We Rise. Um, and it's, it's really, um, it's, I think the, the backbone of what Kenneth has, has done in terms of his collection that he's amassed over the last 25 years. Um, so again, it's leading, teaching by example, and of course, lifting as he rises. So um, as we rise, I hope I'm not stealing too much thunder <laughs> from Ken, but as we rise has three chapters, community identity and power, um, which are convergent themes within black life that spans the globe and um, which are also really evident in the work of photographers June Clark and Bedemi Oloyedi. So their work often oscillates and touches upon black community identity and power. And tonight we're here to discuss identity in particular, 
but I know we're going to get into all of it um, with everyone here. So I think um, I'll shut up and I will uh, get this get this party moving. So I'll pass the mic to you, Ken. Wow, I don't think I have to say anything, Liz. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, very flattering of you uh, to go on like that. But I have to say, I need to turn it back on you and say you are the student that's overtaken the master. Look at you. Anyway, I, I'm very thrilled in particular that you are doing this uh, incredible work with the Bamako Encounters uh, next year. I'm hoping that the pandemic will allow us to to get over there and uh and support but I'm, I'm really looking forward to that your wealth of uh of knowledge with photography and the many things that you've done over the years so thank you liz for uh for participating and, and being such an important voice uh with this book so um very very briefly um i'm a dentist in toronto who started collecting work that that really was about um a, a journey of self you know i i was born and grew up in windsor ontario and it's the southernmost canadian city it's across from detroit michigan and it's a place that you know really um well it was like an island for my family we were a jamaican immigrant family in the 60s in a place that you know i think we're the second jamaican family to to get to windsor and you know this is really kind of interesting was the context is you know that you know, I'm the only black kid in the class, but you know, across the river is Detroit, Michigan, with this vibrant African American culture, and of course, within my home, you know, there's this super vibrant Caribbean culture with the food and the music and just the values. Like it, it, you know, so I kind of grew up with this tricultural kind of um, background, and it, I think it's it's very evident in the work that I collect. The the you know, this book from Aperture, this is a thrill for me, and. You know, this, this title, As We Rise, has to do with my late father, Spurgeon Montague, who was always using that phrase, uh, you know, as you do well, you have to kind of pull up the people in your own community, you know, and, and get them to pull to come up as well. So this lifting as we rise became a kind of a family motto. And then the subtitle, um, you know, photography from the Black Atlantic, I think in the early discussions with Denise, um, Denise Wolf, who, you know, was an old friend who we met in Bamako over a decade ago. She, she was the one I think that was really thinking about um, place. And, you know, when I was talking about it early on with the collection, it was about work from the UK, from the African continent itself, from South America, from the Caribbean, from America, from Canada. And it was obvious that my collection was, you know, uh, really about um, celebrating artistic practices are peripheral to the Atlantic. So, you know, hence that subtitle. And then there's this beautiful um, kind of sense of uh, uh, connectedness that happens with uh, a collection if you kind of put things together in a way where, you know, one object is purposely sort of in dialogue with another. And I think that's that's how the Wedge Collection grew organically. Uh, the first image that really was burned in my brain uh, was as a 10-year-old seeing this image of the Harlem Renaissance by James Van Der Zee. 1932, you know, the couple's just wearing raccoon coats. It's a pretty elegant car, this Cadillac with white wall tires. And it's really, you know, the, the background with the Harlem brownstones. And I just wasn't seeing images of Black people that looked like this when I was a 10 year old. I was watching, you know, I don't know, good times on TV and these shows that my family would laugh at, not laugh with, you know, we were kind of like, this isn't reflecting who we are. So this really got me and got me hooked. And I, even as a 10 year old, I wanted to have a longer relationship with, with photographs and just seeing them on the walls of a gallery. And as soon as I could, I think as a, as a dentist uh, years later, maybe a decade later, I started to collect. And, um, and I think, you know, moving forward, you can see this is how I live now. These are images from my dental office uh, just this month. Um, Jamel Shabazz works uh, from, you know, the New York in the 80s or in the waiting room. That work changes all the time. Um, there's a private staff room where we're getting out of all our PPE these days and everyone's all stressed at work, but we sort of really enjoy the beauty and the serenity of this Zavira Simmons image from uh, the Colorado River, it's called Denver, just takes us away to another place. Um, moving forward, um, 
here's an image that is from a show that was um, works were gleaned from the Wedge Collection, a show called Positions Desire that I organized uh, at my old uh, universe, or sorry, Art Gallery in Windsor in Windsor. And this is a show that toured around Canada in the last decade. The image is by Dawit Petros called Sign. And it's very prototypical in a lot of ways of um, the, the work of uh, emerging Black Canadian photographers that's thinking about who we are, where we're from, where we're going. And, and I think we'll spend a bit of time tonight, I'm sure Liz, talking about you know, the many different practices, the many ways of being Black in Canada. So uh, moving forward, uh, there's the cover of the book I was referring to. That beautiful uh, typeface was the work of Trace Seals, As We Rise, the font, it was a custom font called Martin, as in Martin Luther King. And it's, it's really based on the sanitation workers' signs that, you know, that read, I am a man. And you can see that beautiful handwritten feeling to them. And I think that that was a, a you know a beautiful gesture on the part of Jeanette Abing from uh, Rational Beauty, the company that, uh, that, that that Aperture brought in to design the book. They they brought in this young black uh, typographer. It's a great move. Um, moving forward, yeah, those those three lenses that Liz talked about the the Wedge Collection. You know, in this case, this book is being uh, we're looking at the work through the lens of community identity power. In this community section, you can see work by Barclay Hendricks, uh, the late great artist who became a good friend. The work on the left was, was taken in Southfield, Jamaica, the, the hometown of my family. Uh, Barclay happened to by chance have a home down there, a, a vacation home. And uh, you can see his shadow on the on the, the bottom left. And for me, that's such a kind of a, an interesting take on identity too, like the, this idea of his shadow, his, his imprint on the image. Um, you know, of course, he was obsessed with color, <laughs> obsessed with women. It's interesting to see those images. Um, here's work by one of our great Canadian photographers, um, Michelle Pearson Clark, uh, who's really capturing the, the 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 beauty and the importance of our own Black artistic practices, our community here, our art community. And I think you know this is from a much larger body of work where. She's really just, um, I think, in, in a way, kind of showing everyone kind of who we are. So again, being and becoming. Um, moving forward, uh, the section power, we had a great talk around power uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago. Um, this power section really for me is black power. It's like thinking about uh, work locally and artists like Camille Turner and uh, Kamal Purvai, who are doing, you know, they, they were rethinking a, a, a slave wanted ad. This is one of these ads that was in Montreal Gazette. So, you know, a, 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 when slavery was in Canada and an ad that was like, you know, put out in a, in a newspaper in our country saying, you know, like this guy who is wearing, you know, a light colored, um, you know, shirt coat and he's, you know, wearing the breeches that, you know, to look out for this slave on the run. And of course, these artists are rethinking this, this text and this and putting it in a new context and taking ownership of the image and saying, you know, in a, in a restaurant in downtown Toronto right now, this, this young black Canadian subject is wearing those clothes and, you know, he has agency and he's, you know, at rest and having a drink. And, you know, it, it's just a really great idea. The actual photograph is the size of a bus stop ad and it's illuminated as such. So it's very, almost reads like a Gap ad or an Old Navy ad or something, a very interesting idea. Um, Renee Cox on the right, uh, it's beyond the self-portrait. She's really embodying um, a Jamaican national hero, um, Queen Nanny of the Maroons, who was the person that, that would you know raid plantations and pull out the enslaved people and had them run with her into the hills. And, you know, every Caribbean island has these stories, you know, it's, uh, there's Mazali in, in Trinidad. It's, it's very interesting um, part of history that we don't talk about this. You know, th these are true heroes, risk everything to save lives. And it's an important part of Jamaican national identity. It's a great series that she has. Moving forward. Um, and then we get back to Toronto. Um, this uh, is an image uh, by Jelani Morgan. And 
and it's really it was the first um protest on a large scale from the black lives matter canada movement and it really started here in toronto and it was a die-in it was a moment that people were in protest uh it was the murder of eric garner i believe this was probably 2014 and um for people who know our city it's a very familiar spot it's where people gather we have concerts it's where people protest it's dundas square in toronto and it's it's just um to say to everyone you know with this book that black lives matter here there everywhere and that this is a long history and that we have a history of protests in canada much longer than the recent black lives matter movement i think maybe tonight liz we could talk a little bit about resistance here in this country too it's important for me as a collector that you know having so much work around black canadian artistic practices that the aperture book would highlight you know the canadian artists and give them airspace as well or pages uh, as well i think this is like a unique opportunity for global readers to learn more about our really rich and important and you know historic black canadian uh, artistic community so uh yeah jelani's a great one of our great artists the identity section we'll talk more about this of course tonight uh if we move forward has a uh you know work from muhammad kamara uh, who's from Bamako, Mali, and uh, you know, at that time was a young artist who was in Europe, and he would take pictures, in the various locales when he was doing artistic, you know, artist residencies, and it's about the black body being in these unexpected places. In this case, in the Alps, um, the work on the right is Texas Isaiah, who really needs no introduction. One of our great uh, contemporary black photographers uh, did a residency. Um, at the uh, studio museum in Harlem uh, now and is sort of uh, doing incredibly important commercial work that's putting um, trans people, uh, queer people at the forefront in images that sort of is again placing people in a, you know in a position where you know look at us this is who we are and and I just think it's such an important development that you know uh, emerging photographers are using the commercial uh, arena to get messages across in a way that was really not even acceptable previously in photography. It's an interesting moment as a collector over 25 years to see how many of the young Black artists coming out are doing work that lands on the cover of Vogue magazine or GQ as much as work that's in museums. I think it's a great development. I think photography is democratic and, and for everyone. Um, and, and finally, an image from Sandra Brewster, uh, one of our great artists, um, uh, Guyanese Canadian. A lot of her work in this important blur series is thinking about people in our in our Caribbean Canadian community and the history, the migration of people like my family moving from oftentimes, say, Jamaica to England to Canada, from Guyana, you know, to New York to Toronto. And the movement is sort of, uh, you know, this blur uh, with the dye transfer and this process she uses, it's kind of a metaphor for the movement of people. Um, and I think that might just cut it. Uh, and I'll hand it back to, uh, or should I hand it over to the artist? Uh, June Clark, one of our greats. Go ahead, June. Uh, where am I? Can you hear me? We can. Uh Okay, uh, I find that uh, when when you were talking about the uh, the rich life that you lived at home, I uh, came to Canada. I was actually wrenched from from New York from Harlem uh, abruptly because of politics and came to Toronto, and I found that. With the uh, camera, I try to recreate or capture the uh, what I had lost. So I, I discovered Bathurst Street very early on in the uh, 70s and just throw Bathurst Street and, and found images of people 
that I needed to feel and, and know and uh, understand what was going on in Toronto, but still trying, I suppose, to recreate what I had uh, lost in, in coming to Toronto. And I found this community of people and all of these incredibly beautiful people who uh, had life and, and, and helped me come to terms with being in an alien environment in Toronto. And I was able to, to photograph many, many people on uh, Bathurst Street, as well as the storefronts. And uh, it helped me, uh, as I say, come to terms with being in what I felt an alien environment until I came, met many people and, and came to uh, begin the, the uh, help start the Women's Photography Cooperative and, uh, and found a group, found a home within a group of women who were also learning photography. And uh, I was uh, one of these people. So I, in terms of identity and in terms of uh, power and that I found it through photography. So that's really, you know, I'd love to hear what the Demi says now. All right. So for this, um, so for this project, the the kind of impetus, like the driving force behind it, really stemmed from um, research I was doing in my thesis year of undergrad, where I was looking into the the history of the photographic medium. As someone who is very interested in sort of like historical processes, I was really researching. So like the origins of this of the of the medium. So, uh, and while I was doing that, I that was when I was properly exposed to sort of like the ways throughout every stage of advancement, really, for photography. I was exposed to the ways in which the medium was weaponized and used as a tool of power and influence, right? To uh, diminish the blacks essentially. So the medium, I was exposed to the way in which the medium was um, was weaponized against blacks, and that got me uh, thinking. Got me thinking about a lot. It got me thinking about um, our consumption of photographs as well uh, by the and also by the masses as well as um, individually. Um, and so I stumbled upon. The project, which I'm sure a lot of people are going to be familiar with, which is the daguerreotypes by J.T. Zeely. And for those who aren't familiar, they were essentially a commission by um, Louis Agassi, who was a professor at Harvard. He commissioned J.T. Zeely to make daguerreotypes of slaves in plantations. Okay, and this was the plant. I believe in South Carolina, and this was in 1850, so just a few years after the birth of photography itself. Uh, it was already sort of like taken over and used uh, to sort of like exercise this colonial gaze. And so like his, his point he was trying to prove back in those times where photography was mostly used for ethnographic and very anthropological uses, was to sort of prove that Blacks were an inferior race. So JT Zeely then made these daguerreotypes, this portfolio, which was showcasing these Black slaves, which were very sort of like horrific images. You know, you could see the sort of like despondent looks in their faces, obviously, as people who were going through slavery on the plantation. 
in the South. Um, and then those later on, I believe, ended up in an anthropological museum. So you can see how even the earliest of mediums was, was used to diminish uh, black bodies, right? So I decided to take on this project where I was gonna attempt to tell a counter narrative to that. So rather than sort of like just making regular photographs and sort of like photoshopping it to look old, I was looking for ways to combat the, um, the associations that we are used to making when interacting with historical images or even just visual representations of black people. So I decided to make these uh, tin types, which is a historical process from the 1800s. Uh, I decided to make it in the same way it was made back then of those slaves, but then try to give the agency to the subject because back in the day, black subjects did not have a say in how they were represented. So the identity was pretty much up to the colonial gaze. So now, and that sort of like made a ripple effect where most people interacting with old images that look like this of black folks immediately make the association of, you know, this could be a slave or this was the maid of the of like a, a white family back then. So I tried to employ a strategy which was using a 19th century medium to photograph contemporary African Canadians. And the strategy sort of like in and of itself was already going to sort of shatter the those preconceived um those preconceived uh, notions that people have when interacting with his historical processes take this image for example where uh when i had this on display one time people came up to it being like oh that is like a historical photograph and then upon closer inspection see that he's wearing an adidas tracksuit you know what i mean so that already starts to break down those con tensions and how people like view uh this historical black um this historical mediums when it has like a, a black subject in it and i gave for me the project was really about you know balancing that scale because when you look at those older images there was quite the imbalance right it was basically black bodies white science so i was trying to tip that scale back over and that's why i'm the project it's mainly about sort of like the amplification and trying to tear down those associations that people make. So they sort of like think twice when they have, a, when they come in contact with these images. Um, you know, more about agency over supremacy is what I'll say. It was kind of like that, right? So uh, this can was I mean, the, I, the work I made. Yeah. Can I jump in? Because this is really amazing and I'm really excited to kind of um, ask a question from, from this. Um, place too, because yep. um, I think it's really interesting too, because I, I know too, I think I've spoken to you as well about also the history of, you know, um, Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth in terms of um, uh, claiming photography as a, as a tool of agency as well. And I think that it, 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 these, um, portraits like your portraits which are you know very contemporary as well they are this counter narrative but they also um play into a, a history that we um that we carry of of black agency you know from the beginning you know um i think frederick Douglass's first um portrait was in 1840 so or 1839 and um and so i'm really curious because i think that there's um there's this relationship between the idea of um, refuting this kind of this this um, presence through photography of um, of black people as being um, always in this sense of oppressed being to being um, a proud, glorious, beautiful, strong, um, all of these elements, and um, I think. I, I this connection that I'm kind of seeing between both you and June's work in terms of like June, you just mentioned that you use photography um, to capture something that was lost, and and so you you're using this you're using this tool 
like I think you both are using this tool of photography um, as this as this um, place to connect and to bring together um, a sense of community um, within your own practices. So I'm wondering if you could um, if you could talk to that because I think the other thing is that you both have um, um, a practice that is in portraiture, but also in street photography as well. So maybe maybe there's something there that you could um, talk about. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Fed Frederick Douglass because in fact, at one point he was the most photographed person on the planet really. And, and he was saying, I am a man. I am my person. And so that was very interesting. And then I, for me, doing the street photography was important because of course in Harlem, that's what you did. The street was our life and the street, uh, I couldn't go anywhere on my block and not know anyone. And also everyone on that block was able to discipline me. And I knew I had to behave because my parents would find out that's, so that was very, very important for me to have that identity. I don't, okay, put them in. Yeah, yeah um, that, sorry. No, no, you were saying? <laughs> Oh, well, I, I know th there's a few images that aren't in the book, Bidemi, but I know that there's um, a particular image of um, a West African woman that you photographed on the streets of Toronto. And I, I know I've, I've seen you quoted in terms of your relationship to that work, which I think really corresponds with what June is saying. So I'm wondering if, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was, um, you know, from what June said, it's kind of like the the familiarity right like I was on the streets essentially and I seen a woman dressed head to toe in sort of like Sunday African attire and I couldn't relate to it like anymore you know it was kind of like a mirror uh, I wish I could show the image actually because she's sort of at a bus stop and she sticks out so much because everyone else is kind of like in western clothing waiting for the street car and she's kind of like head to toe with the head wrap um, and everything and everyone's kind of like on their phone but she's looking right at me so she's kind of like very aware and I just saw that as a mirror really of myself in that moment as well walking around taking images and like searching for my community here right and also just bringing up additional questions of why she chose to step out of the house looking like that that day right if we're coming back to identity right there's a lot of us who move here and he just kind of like immediately conform to, you know, westernized like forms of clothing and whatnot. But like, that wasn't even a Sunday, for example. It was definitely not a Sunday. And she was dressed head to toe in that outfit. So what does that say about her identity? And, you know, how that could sort of strike a chord with me when I interact with it and why that would make me photograph it, right? It's that thing about familiarity and also just things you come across in the everyday. It's all about everyday people, really, for me. I'm, I really do this for like the everyday people. I have to jump in, Liz, and just say, you know, the Demi, speaking of familiarity, you know, an image that I love of your tin types is one of June Clark. And so you two must have a history. I don't know. <laughs> the two of you might want to talk a little bit about that nah. session. That particular image is not in my Wedge collection. I'm thrilled that it's part of the Art Gallery of Ontario's collection and their curator um, at the time, curator in photography, Julie Crooks, uh, recognized the brilliance of that work. It was in your student show a few years ago at the Ontario College of Art and Design. And she just called me that day, the first day of the Grad X show at OCAD U. And she's like, you've got to see this work from this young Nigerian Canadian photographer. Oh, she was going on and on. And Julie was excited, like uh, it was palpable. And she snatched up that image of June Clark which was great because June had just had a show at the AGO, I think at that time. And it was very apropos for their growing um, photography collection. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that session, the two of you, because I'm well, sorry, yeah. I'm taking over Liz, but I want them to talk about it. No, that, that's that great. Was, that was when I, I uh, had a residency at uh, OCAD. 
And I met Bademi then and he uh, asked me, I worked with Miro McMaster as well. And, and Bademi said, would you come in and uh, do this? And it was, I, not only the chemicals and the process, it was a long sitting. He, we really had to figure it out. And, and uh, he had me sit there. I know they talk about holding the back of the head or whatever, but he didn't have me do that. But it was a long session and it was fun. And we got to know each other very well, I think. Yeah, I had heard that June was coming into my class to give a talk. Uh, and I obviously was familiar with her work from the AGO and obviously obsessed. So as opposed to being in the class for the talk, I was I heard last minute, right? So I was making the chemicals, I was mimicking it all up in the lab while she was giving the talk <laughs> in an attempt to try to catch her before she leaves. So I caught like the end of the talk and then when she was done, I was kind of like, you know, the studio's ready for you kind of thing. So, <laughs> so then we went in and, you know, it was it was a long sitting, but again, it's a process from the 1800s. It's not digital. So, so you know, in the end, we made like some some magic, some beautiful images, you know. And it's also one of the things I think about where um, I had known of all the work that she has done. You know, starting this movement coming from Harlem, and that's one of the things I wanted to sort of encapsulate in that one image, right? This is someone doing important work. So, which is exactly what Frederick Douglass was talking about, where it's like, you know, it creates like a thought picture, you know? So the person is, is an identity thing, right? The, the person in the image, like that's the reason why he was at some point the most photographed man in the world, right? He knew the power of an image and now we all know what he looks like. Has he not yeah. done that? We would will probably have known about his works through books, but not as she puts that work to a face. So if anyone's asking down the line, or even just for educational purposes, we have that record of the person who has done this amazing work, right? So yeah. all of that ties into why I did that work. Mm -hmm. It was a fun session. <laughs> I think that also you know, ties into the idea of like the record or the materiality of photography and, both of you um, play with the physicality of photography, you know, through etchings and tintypes, photo transfers, collage, and you both photograph predominantly in black and white. So I mm. think about how, um, you know, you're, you're already playing with um, materiality and also the idea of history um, and, and the contemporary. So um, I wonder if you could speak to like the thinginess of photographs and the importance of its relationship to your, your work? Uh, for <laughs> me, I'll go, I'll go. Okay, I'll good, go. good. <laughs> for me, for me when, I make, when I make work or I photograph is, I'm mostly thinking about archival permanence, right? So much of black history and black art has been lost, you know, even though they once existed as physical. Right, so, so for me, it's on top of the, the idea of boosting that amplification of the works, you know, so like what Ken is also doing by collecting, mm -hmm. you know, is for me to make works that would last. That's why I shoot everything using analog mediums. That's why I make prints in the dark room. That's why I make tintypes because we're still discovering tintypes from the 1800s today. So the ones I'm making today would, outlast me essentially and that's the point uh, I was listening to uh, the earlier talk with Van Lee Burke where he said he's kind of like the connoisseur of the images you know so the images I'm making are not necessarily for me it's it's my job to make them and pass them on so they should outlive me and that's again just comes back to the importance of building an archive you know and sort of like getting into archival processes uh, like a tintype, for example, which is like a one of one and basically lasts forever. So that's yeah, I, where I think about them. Yeah, yeah I, I feel the same way in the sense of wanting my photographs to last to, to for other people. And uh, I, again, 
my most of my work is about memory and that's where my etchings come in because i i wanted to create an image where you're not certain whether the image is emerging or receding and and for me that's the elusiveness of memory and and that was part of why i originally began photography to capture images that I remembered, if you can understand that, to, to see someone on a stoop and remember all of the people who sat on the stoop and uh, the feet of people or the hands of people. And that was very, very important for me to, to do this and, and, and have people hold them and, and, and maybe feel the, the, the need I had to, to, uh, for permanence. Mm -hmm. yeah. I really am. And so originally when I, when I had the, uh, uh, residency at the Studio Museum, it also happened where I walked around Harlem. And, and when I went back, I realized that everything had changed for me there and absolutely nothing had changed. And so I was trying to come to terms with being back in Harlem and why I, I didn't use the camera at my eye because I didn't want to edit. I didn't want that. So I had the camera at my hip and walked around and snapped photographs mm -hmm. of that. And that's the origin of the Harlem quilt. And I realized, again, I, I do a lot of work from a kid's point of view. And I realized when I had the camera at my hip, I was photographing like a seven-year-old mm -hmm. walking around the street. And, and that is what turned into the Harlem quilt. I think that, um, you know, thinking about the fact that you were born and raised in Harlem and Bedemi, you were born and raised in Port Harcourt, what what is my brethren <laughs> my family's from ph2 so that's nice i like these connections um but both of you were, were fortified in spaces that were predominantly black and um and so and I, i'm really curious about your like your um you know impressions of black canadian identity when you first um, arrived and how that's changed and how it's um, how it's affected and impacted you now and especially just because June you said going back you saw that things had changed and nothing had at all and also too I, you know Ken can get in on this too because because of his connection through Windsor and also being just across the water from Detroit you know I think there's all these really interesting you know relations to a specific Black Canadian identity that I, I'd be curious for you to speak on. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, again, I didn't leave Harlem until I was about 27 years old. So I had my identity there. And again, I tell this story of when I was 18 going downtown for my first job and realizing that all of these people thought I'd come from this horrible place, this horrible, dangerous place. I was just shocked because the, the, there was no place like Harlem and it was amazing for me. And I was allowed to grow up and feel very, very comfortable in my skin and very, very, at home with all of these people. And I do, I, I made a piece uh, early on and it's called For When We Go Downtown. And it's a piece of where we, we would put 
an amulet in our pocket be, to go out of the neighborhood and be safe. So uh, yeah, it, it's on my site. It, it's it's uh, so I I again I had to rethink things because I felt very comfortable who I was for two decades. I don't know about the Demi or, or Ken. <laughs> you want to go, go ahead, but Demi, you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. For me, I, I mean, I had not lived outside Nigeria, right? So coming here was kind of like a myriad of experiences where uh, I had to sort of learn a lot very quickly. I also came here alone, first time on the plane by myself. You know, all the way down here with no How relatives old were here. You? I was about fifteen. Uh huh. Uh -huh. About fifteen, sixteen. Yeah. Uh, so then coming and then being based in Hamilton, which was where I went to school. That was when, you know, I had to sort of like learn from people's speculations, right? Because people be like, "Oh, um, are you Caribbean?" And I didn't quite understand. Or where's your accent from? Didn't quite understand the question. Uh, I was like, you're the one who has an accent, I don't. So um, <laughs> it was kind of like things like that where I had to sort of like maneuver. And what I sort of tell people all the time, uh, going back to what Liz is asking is, I really became a black man when I crossed the border. Mm -hmm. Because that was not a term that was thrown around black was. And when we spoke, when we said black back home, we're more mostly talking about the intensity of the darkness of your skin, how dark you are, if anything. Uh, so that was, I really became, you know, a black man when I crossed the border. And then that was sort of where photography came in, where I was then free to roam around. So photography, the camera became like my passport, right? So that was what took me out of the house and to go places. And so like photographed the, all the things I hadn't seen or experienced. I remember at the time I wasn't even photographing uh, black folks yet because I was already familiar with black folks. I grew up with black folks. That was familiar to me. I was more focused on photographing the things I hadn't seen. So I was just photographing literally everything else. Uh, and then over the years, then experiencing what comes with being a black man in the West was what then again triggered that research that triggered everything else where I then started looking for my community here. Right. That's when I started asking those mm -hmm. questions. That's when I started asking, like, <clears throat> like where are where are the black folks? Like, that's when I started to understand that there's still self segregation still happening. Right. This area of the city is mostly populated with blacks, but it kind of has like a negative connotation on it. Where it's like, oh, don't go there. You know, it's sketchy or whatever. And I lived downtown mm -hmm. at the time, so you know, that's when I started to see all these things, and then going to New York this one time for three days with my friend and discovering Gordon Parks and then my whole life changing and looking at the camera in a different way, right? As like a weapon to fight injustice and all these things and then coming back and then starting to make this work, right? Work, I, I sort of like give myself the mission of making work that matters, right? And that was when all the research and experiences that I had been through then started being poured um, into the work I was making, right? That's when the focus kind of turned to Black folks because it was like, we don't have enough. We need to sort of like amplify everything essentially. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like my experience um, coming here and, you know, and still is because uh, that's when you start noticing the, you notice the looks, you know, and everything. You're walking around with your camera and you're getting the look, you know, or, I'll tell you a quick story. When I was at Nathan Phillips Square, just with a Canon AE1, so like photographing a statue and a cop comes up to me asking questions like, why am I taking photos of the statue? What's it for? And I was like confused because it was the middle of summer and there was all these tourists around me at Nathan Phillips Square with cameras. And I was like, how come I'm getting so like the question? And I kind of like put the camera down for a little bit after that. I was just kind of like, what is, what is this? You know what I mean? And then getting back on it, obviously, with the more rebellious mindset and just like I'll do it anyways <laughs> uh and then just making work like that till now right and that's kind of like how my work is 
it's evolving and that's why I find myself in all these spaces where I'm really trying to amplify the culture through photographs. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I find both of your stories are very interesting for me and, and you know, and so different. And I have another very different story. You know, I, I was born and grew up here, but again, as I mentioned, there was that, you know, duality, the, the home experience and the out of the home experience was a radically different thing. You know what I mean? You know, and yeah. yeah and, and then there was that, that third thing for me going over to Detroit. When you're about 15 years old in Windsor, you start going to Detroit every weekend to socialize because it's just a great city, period, and a bastion of Black American culture. So, you know, I literally was, and, and you know, there's an interview that Liz and I do at the end of the book, a conversation we have in As We Rise, where I talk about this in more detail. I'm going to encourage folks to read that because I talk about code shifting to say, to save my life, you know, this idea of having to be in a white environment at school and in church that I went to in Windsor and and having to sort of be a certain, put on a certain cloak or coat of identity that I could really take off in Detroit and be more of myself because I was around Black folks and didn't have to in some way pretend or to be something that I thought would please other people, you know? So this idea of freedom, you know, was inherent, you know, inherent with, with these visits to Detroit, but it was a lot of back and forth. I mean, I grew up with this much you know, rock music as I did with my reggae music as I did with my soul music in Detroit. And, you know, on a given night in Detroit, I might see a punk group like Iggy Pop. And later that night, I'm going to see, you know, Inner City or Carl Sanderson or Derek May or listen to like house music. And, you know, I played guitar in a reggae punk band. And that was who I was because of those influences. A group like The Clash I completely identified with this idea of taking Jamaican dub music and something that was very English in terms of, you know, uh, rock music and making it into something of your own. I was doing that in my own little band with our little single Black Preppies. And, you know, it was always subversive, but it was very much an expression I'd see now as of me trying to forge my own identity. And, I, and I'm proud of all those influences now. It's, it's who I am, you know, but... It, but it was very difficult then. And I know you know this too, June, you know, the two worlds, very difficult, yeah. you know, remembering this was the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, in the 70s. And I remember coming here and I invariably would be asked, what island are you from? And I was able to say Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> That's cute. Um, I'm going to um, get to some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, there's actually one question that I wanted to uh, want to preface because um, it kind of leads into a question that I had. Um, so uh, Teju Cole um, introduces us to the Wedge Collection in As We Rise. Um, and, and it's in this letter to a friend, which he writes, quote, uh, in the vast majority of these pictures, we see people who are looking at the camera, at the photographer, generally at their ease, dressed as they wish to be. The portraits are highly intentional in the sense that both the photographer and the sitter are ready for the photograph to be made, in the sense that consent is explicit or implied, and yet they are not formal or rigid, not even the ones made in a studio. And it is perhaps this feeling of ease above all that makes us think these are family pictures. This is a family album. And what I love about that is that there's this sense of um, connection and understanding. There's like a knowing that you see this relationship between the photographer and the, and the sitter. And I, it's, it's, to me, it's clear as day, like in June in your images in the book and, and Bedemi with yours, that there is this inherent um, uh, care that's, that's um, a relationship between you and, and the sitters. Yes. Um, a lot and, of trust. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's uh, yeah, it's evident, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a question um, from Mark Silverberg that is, are, the, are there significant differences between the way the colonial gaze of photography casts 
indigenous Latinx people in contrast with black people that have been spoken about. And so I, I'm thinking that to me, the, the main thing that I see is this relationship, the relationship between the photographer and the sitter. But I, I wonder if there's any, any additional things you would like to add. I think it comes down to community again, right? I think when it comes to that, it's really about seeing ourselves and align ourselves to be seen as the photographer, as a subject, right? And like you mentioned, there's that, uh, there's that trust. And uh, it really, really revolves around community because when we're talking about other marginalized uh, races and groups, there are people working within those communities doing the work that we're doing for our communities, right? Fighting these battles, you know, at the same time. So I don't think it's really something we could place against themselves. I feel like the work is happening within these communities as, uh, as they should and to the capacity that they, that they should. Like there's a myriad of artists and photographers that are from marginalized communities who are making very powerful works, essentially doing the same amplification and talking about the same uh, sort of like past struggles and still pushing this empowerment you know, on the community, which in turn helps the community, right, to rise. So I think that's, that would be sort of like my, my take on it. I think that really speaks to the, to the idea of a family album. I think you're both crafting, um, crafting images that go, that are their goal or their intention as I see it is to create a, you know, an album, a family album, a collection that is, is for yourself um and and our community so i think that that's that's that that difference would possibly be when the when the creator the photographer is not necessarily focusing or you know um anchored to that then then i think you see that when their when their audience isn't necessarily for themselves or for their community which would be the sitters we, we will we will see that yeah i think so um, sure. Yeah. Let's see if there's any more questions. Oh, um, David Zapparoli, um, a, a, another amazing Toronto photographer. Right. Boop, yeah. Boop, boop, boop. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, asks um, for you, June, um, can you talk about the importance of the Women's Photography Cooperative um, that you oh, founded? Wow. Belong, belong to for, for quite a while? Well, I was thinking that for me, photography saved my mental life, really. And to come here and find, there were about seven of us, to find a group of women who were all like-minded and wanted to learn and at the time, I don't know if people realized that uh, Ryerson really what was starting, but uh, we knew it wasn't starting for women. U of T had a dark room that didn't allow women. And so we began with Laura Jones and her husband John Phillips had a gallery on uh, Baldwin Street, the Baldwin Street Gallery. And that's how we uh, began. It was Laura and Pam Harris and Lisa Steele and myself and other women. And we learned together. We learned the Ansel Adams zone system. We taught ourselves that and uh, we curated shows, we uh, uh, had a dark room for women to come in and use, and, and these women saved my life. They really did. That's incredible. How long was the cooperative together for? Oh gosh, I can't seem to remember. I don't know, seven, eight years. I can't remember. You'd have to, Laura Jones, is the keeper 
of all of this. She has an amazing archive and she has an amazing brain in her head to have all of these, these, uh, this data. And uh, it's, it, it needs to be put in a wonderful home. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I really want to see that archive. For the last 50 years. Wow. All right. I, I, I can't emphasize how important, you know, women's art resource. Like it was just, you know, in the time I kind of came up as a collector in Toronto, just there was really nothing like it. There was no resource. They it was a do-it-yourself project the whole way. Right. You know, I yeah. mean, it was so important. And you know, June is so downplayed. You know, I have to say I just came back from Art Basel, Miami Beach last week, and you know, her well, the, the the booth with Danny Fria's gallery that was, you know, it's a sort of a solo presentation of uh, June's work. It was Harlem Quilt. People hadn't seen this thing. It was work from 1967, and it was so powerful because the work could have been made right now. It was so of the moment. And I have to say, it was, uh, you were, your work was, you were the bell of the ball down there, June. <laughs> it's a pity you couldn't get down there to see it. I, it was in the main fair of Art Basel, and it, for me, it was thrilling to see work by a Black woman Canadian artist, you know, center stage at Art Basel Miami. It's like overdue, you know, so kudos yeah. to you and to Danny for making that happen. Yeah, yes, certainly. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, Daniel did it all, really. <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah. 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 More power to you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Liz, any, any other questions? Yes, I was just going to say, um, our wonderful Maria Catalopoulos has a, a question here. Um, she's wondering if, Bedemi, if you could speak a little bit about the use of chapters in the organization of your work on your website. Um, it signals towards a larger narrative. Um, and it, there's more here in terms of conceptualizing his practice that um, that would be great. I, I, I think maybe she's referring to to the Black Archive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on why I use chapters. Um, most of the work, I don't put like a finite uh, timeline on my projects. Everything is kind of ongoing till I'm not going anymore, <laughs> I suppose. So, uh, and also I explore like a myriad of of avenues, right? Like I, I could shoot on the streets, I make portraits, you know, I could shoot at parties, I could shoot balls. I'm pretty much um, everywhere. So it's almost like trying to put everything under this big umbrella. So I separated by chapters where, you know, I could speak about daily life, you know, for example, just uh, photographs of everyday people doing everyday things in the everyday. You know, that's for me is, that for me is top because I, I value the everyday person doing the everyday thing, mm -hmm. right? And I could speak into another chapter where I'm talking about more like the ten types we spoke about. So more, you know, telling counter narratives based on what has happened in the past and how we're going to use that information of what's happened in the past to move forward, you know? So that's a different avenue. And I could talk about various things like celebration because we love to celebrate, you know, you go to Caribana, you go to a party, we have our things where someone's song comes on and there's the expression, there's the yelling, there's the freedom, right? It's kind of like using, and with that, for example, I'm trying to talk about how I'm trying to am amplify Black joy, right? Black joy as this, as this way of retaliation, essentially, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that, that's how I speak into chapters and the chapters on the website, are not all the chapters, the chapters for now. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's just gonna be ongoing, but I don't sort of go out to photograph with chapters in mind. I just create, and then when I do come back to study what I've photographed in my archive or what I have in my archive, I then see the sort of recurring threads. And then I could sort of like piece those together into their own chapter because they say a certain thing. Uh, so that's why there's that. Okay. Basically, I can't do one thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually kind of perfect and, and probably a good place for us to um, to stop because I think there's um, you, you both have 
beautiful careers and practices that have have ranged within photography. Um, and it's been really beautiful to see the ways that um, photography has been a tool that has been one of comfort for both of you. Um, and also um, like a tool of agency and power. Um, and, you know, June, you said that you had these amulets that you would take to go downtown. And I think maybe, you know, photography, maybe the camera was your amulet coming here. Um, and, and, but Demi, you saying that yeah. the, the camera was um, a passport for you um, to access these spaces. And so I just really appreciate um, everything that you've brought and, and the ways that you've shared your, your, your practices and your life and, and really thinking about the ways that you weave um, everyday life and, um, and uh, history with with contemporary, um, very real and multifaceted um, Black life. So I'm really mm. grateful for both of you. Um, of course, I'm very grateful for you, Kenneth, for bringing together Bedemi and June in As We Rise. Um, this is, you know, come yeah, on. Yeah. Everybody's got to oh. get it. Just go and get it. <laughs> I got it here too. But I also got something else. Check it out. Look at that. Art Bells of Miami, Black Canadian <laughs> artist. Tao Lewis on the cover. Oh, wow. That's, that was very, the book that was the free right. book that everybody got at the at the fair. And you know, it, this was also a guest uh editor. The guest editor was uh, Vera Simmons. And if you recall our last talk, she was talking about the surprise. And everybody's like, What's the surprise? This was the surprise. She she oh. put the black Canadian artist on a black woman Canadian artist on the cover. And I I have a copy of this for you, Liz, because uh, we should also say happy birthday to Liz. It's Liz's birthday this week. Yeah. Oh, happy yeah. Happy birthday, happy birthday Liz. Liz. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I'm uh, going to add to these thanks, too. I just thank you all, June, <laughs> Demi, Kenneth, Liz, you, for a beautiful conversation to wrap up our series on this book. And I wanted to quote... Uh, Taylor Dumas, who is a young Black woman photographer who wrote in the chat, it's so affirming to see a panel of Black photographers from different generations speaking so powerfully about your work. And I think we all felt that tonight. And, you know, th this conversation continues with the artwork and curating and collecting that you're doing and with the book. And I, I hope we can just take it into uh, to end the year into 2022 and, and beyond. So thank you so much. For, for all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you, Denise. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Denise. Thank you, Aperture. This is great. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you, Aperture. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to everyone tuning in. <laughs> Enjoy care. the book. <laughs>